This video is brought to you by Sailrite. Visit Sailrite.com for all your project supplies, tools, and instructions. In this video tutorial, we'll show you how to make your own Roman Shade. This Roman Shade includes a roller clutch system, which operates via a beaded chain for a smooth operation. We'll transform this uncovered window with a gorgeous Roman Shade. This shade tutorial will include sewn pockets for ribs, and we will show some clever ways to eliminate the tedious job of hand sewing the lift rings in place. Sayerite makes ordering this type of Roman shade easy by providing complete kits which include all the materials needed except the decorative fabric and lining fabric, which you should select on your own. Figuring the calculations for sizing, rib placement, and even ring locations is made super easy for the Roman shade with roller clutch. In fact, you don't even need to do any calculating because you're going to use the Sayerite fabric calculator to do it for you. It sounds pretty easy, right? Well, after watching this video, picking the correct Roman shade roller clutch kit and your decorative and lining fabric from Sayerite, you should be able to make your own in as little as a few hours. Let's get started. The first step for making your Roman shade is to take measurements. We'll be making an inside mount, but an outside mount can also be made. First, we'll measure the width from inner casing to inner casing, or sometimes referred to as jam. Ours is 32 inches in width. Now we need a height measurement, so we'll measure from the upper casing, or head jam, all the way to the stool, or sill. Our measurement is 76 inches. With those measurements in hand, we can go to the Sayerite website and scroll down to where it says Fabric Calculator. Click that. You'll see a calculator that's built for many projects. We're going to select Window Treatments. You'll see many types of shade systems. We want to select the Roman Shade with Roller Clutch System. So select that. Now you can enter the measurements for your particular window. Ours is 32 by 76. The decorative fabric and the lining fabric that we've selected are 54 inches in width. We only need to enter the vertical repeat if more than one shade is desired. For us, we're only doing one, so we'll just leave it at zero. Hit the Calculate button. The Sayrite Fabric Calculator calculates everything, including the amount of decorative fabric that's required and the amount of lining fabric that's required. If you'd like to select your decorative fabric, go to Fabric, then select decor and upholstery fabric. Here you'll see thousands of fabrics that'll work great for a window shade like this. We're going to select a fabric design. We're going to look at the floral and foliage fabrics. So we select it here on the left hand side. Now we can see the multiple floral fabrics that we may want for our Roman shade. Now that you've selected your decorative fabric, it's now time to cut it to size. We'll discuss the lining fabric a little bit later on. Here's our decorative fabric, and now we go to the Sayerite Fabric Calculator to look at the measurements that we need so we can cut our fabric to size. Let's move from a smartphone to a computer screen. The calculator accounts for a quarter inch of clearance on each side of the shade. Our shade is an inside mount, in other words it sits inside the frame of the window, and we measured the width of our window at 32 inches. So our finished width will be a half inch smaller to give a quarter inch clearance on each side of the shade. Now if your shade is an outside mount, you may want to account for the fact that the shade will be a half inch smaller than the width measurement that you enter in the fabric calculator. So for an outside mount, simply add a half inch to your width measurement and calculate. Now you have a finished shade that is exactly what you want for an outside mount. The decorative fabric that we've chosen has a very distinct pattern, and we want that to be centered. So we'll take our cut width, for us it's 36.5, and divide it by 2. Half of our width measurement is 18 and a quarter inches. So we find that center pattern, and we measure over 18 and a quarter inches from it on both sides. And Zach uses a multi-use pin to mark the fabric at that location. The Sayerite Fabric Calculator tells you exactly what size to cut the decorative fabric, shown here in highlighted yellow. Your measurements will likely be completely different. Here he measures over from that center pattern position the 18 and a quarter inches on the opposite side, and he marks it there yet again 
with a multi-use pen. If you like, you can just mark the fabric with a pencil. Then he works a little bit down the length of the fabric and he'll measure from the center pattern where he wants it to be centered, 18 and a quarter inches on both sides there. That way he can strike a line uh, from pin location to pin location down the length of the fabric. Using a straight edge, he'll mark a line. This will be our cut line. This is done to both sides of the fabric at the correct location for the overall width of our cut fabric. If you have a shade that is wider than the decorative fabric that you've selected, like the 64 inches compared to the 54 inch decorative fabric, you will have to join panels together as seen here in the renderings below. For shades that are wider than the width of the fabric selected, we have a separate video showing how to sew the seam going vertical, joining those two panels of fabric together. And it also shows how to accurately do pattern matching, which is often required when joining two fabric panels together. Click the link at the top right to see that video. Our decorative fabric has a distinct pattern and we desire this large flower to be about an inch from the top of the shade. The top of the shade will accommodate a one inch hem, so Zach will mark the fabric at the desired cut location, knowing that one inch of that fabric will be taken up in the one inch hem. Depending on the fabric that you've selected, this may not be an important fact for you, but for us, we wanted that flower at that location. Zach marks the underside of the fabric yet again with a straight edge along that top edge. Since the length of our fabric does not fit on our tabletop, Zach has taken the cut length and divided it by two to find the center location. That way he can pull the fabric down to the bottom edge and measure from that center location to the bottom cut edge of the fabric. Our cut decorative fabric size is 84 inches in height or length. So he's marked it 42 inches and another 42 inches. Then he'll strike a line across the fabric at that location. Again, we're marking the underside or wrong side of the fabric. Then we'll cut it out with shears. If your fabric unravels and is made of a synthetic, you can use a hot knife, but there's really no reason for it because a double hem will be created in the entire shade. Now here's our top edge, and that pin indicated where our cut edge is. We're going to go insert the pin about an inch or so down from the top edge just so that we can remember this is the top edge of our shade so we don't get confused with the bottom edge. Our decorative fabric is now cut to size. Now that the decorative fabric is cut to size, we need to create a two and a half inch hem on both vertical sides of the shade, as seen here in the Sayrite Fabric Calculator. First, we'll create a half inch hem, then we'll create a two inch hem. We love to use basting tape or seam stick. It's a double-sided tape that helps to baste panels or baste seams or hems together prior to sewing so that everything stays in place as you take it to the sewing machine and sew. Here we've applied our quarter inch seam stick for canvas along both long edges of our shade. Now we'll use the clear acrylic ruler and mark one inch from the cut edge of the fabric so that we can fold to that one inch line thus creating our half inch hem. Now applying basting tape and also basting a hem like this can be done in a number of ways, but the best way is to do as Zach is doing here. Watch how he uses his thumb and his forefingers here to create that hem, and he uses his right hand to help guide the edge of the fabric so it falls directly on top of that penciled or struck down line. This way of basting prevents any bubbles and reduces possible stretching that may happen as you baste the hem in place. After the half inch hem is created, we will measure over from the half inch hem or the fold four inches and strike a line there. This will enable us to create our two inch hem as we fold that first hem back to that line. Now here, watch how Zach bastes the basting tape on. He's following that same approach that he basically did when he created the half inch hem. This prevents wrinkles and also hard spots. 
and he will again baste this two inch hem right along that line that he struck on the fabric following that same principle yet again. Three fingers down, thumb smooths it out without pulling on the hem as it is being basted. He's only guiding it. This will create a beautiful hem. Now, if you'd like, you do not have to use basting tape. You could use multi-use pins and pin the fabric in place. Both vertical sides have our two and a half inch hem created and we use an iron to smooth it out and flatten the fabric. Check to make sure the fabric you've selected can be ironed before you do that. We're using a very small thread with a number 12 needle. So here we're going to use the needle threader to thread that very small thread in the eye of the needle. Those are available at Sailrite. In order to keep our stitch nice and straight, we're also going to use the deluxe 5.5 inch magnetic guide. And we'll place it right along the outer edge of our fabric so that our stitch is about an eighth inch away from the inner fold. And we'll create a very nice straight stitch down the length of our 2.5 inch hem, which is actually 2 inches now since a half inch is folded under. We've already checked our tension with this light fabric and light thread and adjusted it so our stitch is perfect. We recommend sewing a home fabric like this with about a three to four millimeter stitch length. We'll be sewing this Roman shade with the Sayrite Fabricator sewing machine. However, a home sewing machine can easily sew these light fabrics, so don't feel like you have to go out and buy a sewing machine just to sew this Roman shade. We're going to start by finishing the top edge. We want to create a one inch hem here. So Zach measures over two inches from the cut edge and strikes a line using the clear acrylic ruler. Then he will use basting tape along that top edge and apply it right along the edge of the fabric. You can also use pins here in lieu of basting tape. He peels off the transfer paper, revealing the double-sided tape, and bastes that edge to the line that he just struck on the fabric. This hem is being folded back to the wrong side of the fabric. At the top edge, we do not create a double hem. It will actually be covered by the lining fabric and also covered by Velcro. It will never be visible. Our shade is rather long, so if we place it diagonally along the table, we can measure from the top edge down to the bottom edge. We'll measure from the finished top edge down to the desired finished length or height of our shade. For us it's 76 inches and we'll place a pin at that location. In order to ensure that our bottom edge is accurate, we'll measure from the opposite side following that same procedure from the top of the shade down to our desired finished length or height of the shade, 76 inches for us. The Sayrite fabric calculator includes extra fabric for a 3 inch double hem along the bottom edge and also 4 inches of extra fabric, so you have plenty to work with. You have a choice here. You can cut away the excess or you can simply create a larger hem along the bottom edge. We've decided to leave the extra fabric in place and just make a larger hem. So Zach struck a line that's two inches above the cut edge, applies double-sided tape, and then bastes a one-inch hem first to that line that he struck down on the fabric. We want this bottom edge to be creased well, so we use an iron along it. Now he folds to the pins, which indicate where our bottom finished edge is. For us, it's 76 inches and he will crease the fabric well with the iron there. This creates a obviously much larger hem than three inches because we did not cut any of the excess fabric away. That is a choice that you can make. We like a large hem along the bottom edge. In lieu of basting, as he's done with every other hem, he will pin this hem in place. So he places a pin along the two outside edges and a few pins in the center position. Now he can take it over to the sewing machine and sew a straight stitch, remembering to do some reversing at the beginning and at the end. And he will sew about an eighth inch from the inner fold of that hem, thus finishing the bottom edge. 
For now, that's all we have to do with the decorative fabric. It's now time to move on to the lining fabric. Next, we'll concentrate on the lining, or sometimes referred to as backing fabric. The homeowner of this shade wanted a material that would allow light to filter through, and because of that, we've chosen a lining fabric that is not a blackout fabric, so light will filter through in the daylight. For our lining, we're using a fabric called Waverly Sun and Shade. Sayerite also carries some great blackout fabrics for lining. Select Drapery Fabric under the pull-down fabric. Then scroll down to Fabric Special Features and select Blackout. These fabrics can be used for a lining and they will block the sun completely. If you have questions about the fabric to select, be sure to give us a call or email us at Sayerite. We're glad to help. Going to the Sayerite Fabric Calculator, we will scroll down to the heading Lining Fabric or Backing Fabric. The cut size of lining for us is 35 and a half inches in width and 93 inches in height. Zach is striking a line along the selvage edge of this lining fabric. This fabric does not have much of a hand, so we have to make sure that it's nice and straight as we strike the line down the side to determine where we will cut the fabric. We've chosen this fabric for our lining fabric because it's 100% polyester for good UV resistance and it does let light filter through the fabric. Here's a look ahead at the finished shade using that Waverly Sun and Shade fabric as a lining. That's exactly what the homeowner wanted for this shade. Now that the selvage edge is cut straight, we can go back to the fabric calculator and look at the cut size of the lining. For the width measurement, Zach places a few marks on the fabric, then uses his straight edge and strikes a line down the running length of the fabric so that we have a lining that is the desired cut width. Once the lining fabric's width is cut to size, we need to create a two and a half inch hem on each of the sides of our shade. We'll apply seam stick for canvas a quarter inch along one of the sides. Using the clear acrylic ruler, we will position it one inch from the cut edge of the fabric and strike a line down its length. This will be a line that we can use to create a half inch hem. We peel off the transfer paper of the seam stick for canvas a quarter inch, revealing the glue, and we will fold the fabric over to the line that we just struck on the edge of the fabric. If you do not have basting tape for canvas a quarter inch or seam stick, you can use pins and pin the fabric in place. After that hem is created, we apply the seam stick for canvas quarter inch on top of that half inch hem, and we will strike a new line that is four inches from the folded edge of the fabric. When we fold that fabric over to that line, this will take up two and a half inches of fabric and will result in a finished hem that actually measures only two inches. Not only that, it will create a finished edge that looks great. No raw edges will be visible. We want to create this same hem on the other vertical side of our lining fabric. We will not show all of that. With light fabrics like this Waverly Sun and Shade, it's a good idea to pull the fabric down the table like Zach did here. That keeps the wrinkles to a minimum as you work along the length of the fabric, or I should say the edge of the fabric. If you selected to use a blackout fabric, most of those fabrics used as a lining have a fairly firm hand, so they are not as flimsy as this Waverly Sun and Shade is. Zach strikes a line across one of the ends, so it's 90 degree to the edge that he just created a hem on. Then he cuts it so it's nice and straight. Now he can measure from this side all the way down the length or height of the shade according to what the fabric calculator says for his cut size of lining. 
since the fabric is too long for the tabletop, he divides the length by two or the height by two, marks the fabric lightly, and then pulls it down the edge of the table so that he can measure from that uh, center mark to the cut edge on the bottom of the lining fabric. A line is struck at that point, so it's perpendicular to the edge, then it's cut, and then we can take it over to the sewing machine and sew those two and a half inch hems on the sides of our lining fabric. A straight stitch reversing at the beginning is sewn down the height of the shade, about an eighth inch from the inner hem or fold. Because we used basting tape or seam stick, sometimes the glue can build up on the needle. When you see that happening, just stop and remove the glue with your fingers. Rubbing alcohol or a goo gone can also be used to clean the needle if required. Typically for heavy duty sewing machines like the Serite Fabricator or Ultra Feed sewing machines, the glue does not affect the sewing. But with home sewing machines, it can cause more of an issue. Now with the lining fabric, we're going to first concentrate on the bottom edge, not the top edge. Here we're striking a line one inch from the cut edge of the fabric. Here we will create a half inch hem. We will apply basting tape for canvas quarter inch along that edge and fold the fabric down to that line. Again, in lieu of the double sided tape, if you don't have that, you can use pins. After this half inch hem is created, we measure from that fold five inches over and we'll strike a line there. Then we will apply basting tape over top of the half inch hem and we will fold that edge over to that line that we just struck on the lining fabric. We talked about basting earlier, but we want to go over it one more time. Notice how Zach holds his three fingers and uses his thumb to baste and he uses his right hand to help guide the fabric and pull the transfer paper off the double sided tape. This keeps the fabric nice and straight and reduces wrinkles and stretch to a minimum. This is especially important for soft materials. Now we can take this bottom edge to the sewing machine and sew it just like we did with any other hem that we created. Always be sure to do reversing at the beginning and the end of your stitching to help lock the stitch in place. Do not concern yourself with finishing the top edge of the lining fabric. That will be handled after we sew in all the pockets for the ribs. Determining where rib pockets are placed is made easy because of the Sayerite Fabric Calculator. Refer back to the Fabric Calculator and look up the lining measurements. That's next. Viewing the calculator on a computer here, you can see the lining measurements here. These are the measurements that are required to make each rib pocket that separates the segments for the Roman shade. Below you see the rendering showing what it will look like on the lining fabric. We will start at the bottom edge of the lining fabric. The depth of the bottom segment for us is 5.5 inches. So we will mark the fabric that measurement from the bottom edge. Then the middle segments are each 8.5 inches up. Our shade has eight middle segments. And then finally the last segment will be 11.5 inches. I'm sure some of you are doing the math. Our 76 inch length does not calculate. But it does if you take into account that each sleeve or pocket for the rib will take up one inch of fabric. We have eight segments, which is nine pockets. So when the pockets are done being fabricated, it calculates out perfectly. If you're confused, don't worry. We're gonna explain it in detail as we go. Here's the lining fabric and we start at the bottom edge. The depth of the bottom segment for us is 5.5 inches. That's the very bottom of the shade. So Zach places a pin at the five and a half inch measurement from the bottom finished edge. Then referring back to the Sarah fabric calculator, we look to see what the depth of the middle segments is. 
it's 8.5 for us. So from that pin, he measures up 8.5 inches and places another pin along that edge. For our shade, we need eight middle segments. So we will repeat those steps eight times. In other words, we'll make eight segments in the middle. And each of those segments for us will be 8.5 inches. So from each pin that's placed in the fabric, he measures up 8.5 inches going up the shade to the top. We've skipped ahead to the last of the middle segments at the top here. Now we come to the top segment. Our calculator says it's 11 and a half inches. So from that last middle segment at the top, we put a pin at 11 and a half inches. Notice there's some excess fabric at the top. That is expected. We accounted for some excess fabric in case of a little bit of shrinkage or any fudge factor. We will now repeat that process on the opposite side of the shade, starting at the bottom edge. There is no need to show this since it's done in exactly the same manner. After you're done placing pins on both the left side and the right side, it's always a good idea to go and double check to make sure that the pins are in the appropriate spot before continuing. Up next we'll be sewing the rib pockets. With the fabric laying as flat as possible, we will start at the bottom edge and grab our pins on the left and right side and tuck the fabric under at that bottom edge so that the hems are facing each other. This Waverly Sun and Shade fabric has a fairly soft hand, so we have to be sure that it's folded directly on the pin and that the sides are lined up and it's folded straight across the fabric. We like to use an iron with a towel placed on the tabletop below and give it a little bit of a crease along that edge. Be sure to check to make sure the fabric you select for your lining can be ironed. Once it's creased well, we will take multi-use pins and start pinning along that folded edge about an inch and a half to two inches from the fold so that we have room for the presser foot to come by and make a half inch stitch along that fold. Place the pins about three to four inches apart all along that folded edge to ensure that the fabric will not move when you take the shade over to the sewing machine and sew the pocket in place for the ribs. This will create our first rib pocket. We'll use the deluxe five and a half inch magnetic guide and place it a half inch from the needle so we can create a stitch a half inch from the fold. The Sayerite Fabricator sewing machine has a needle plate with a half inch marked directly on it so we don't have to measure here a half inch from the needle. Now we will sew a straight stitch doing some reversing at the beginning to lock our stitch in place all along that folded edge. It should be about a half inch from the folded edge. This pocket, which will accommodate our quarter inch rib, is a half inch and it takes up a full one inch of fabric. So our bottom segment is now five inches rather than five and a half inches. When we get to the end of the pocket, be sure to do some reversing there as well to lock the stitch in place. We prefer to make or sew one pocket at a time. So after this pocket is sewn in place, we will take the shade back to the table again and create our next pocket. The pins that were used to hold that first pocket in place are removed. Then Zach grabs the next set of pins directly above the next segment and folds the fabric under, just like he did for the first segment at the bottom of the shade. He again works diligently to lay the fabric as flat as possible and as straight as possible and with the fold directly on those pins that he used to measure up the length of the shade. Once he's happy, he'll use his iron again to crease the fabric along that fold, right where the pins are located. Then he will use pins and pin the two fabric halves together so they do not move when he takes it to the sewing machine to sew them. 
Pens are going to be placed about every three to four inches apart and about an inch and a half to two inches from the folded edge. Skipping ahead here, we take it to the sewing machine, this being our second pocket, and we sew it just like we did for the first pocket. You'll notice here that the pins are a little close to the presser foot. He's able to get by that pin, but uh, for the next pin, he's actually going to have to move it because it's going to run right into the presser foot. So he just lifts his presser foot and pulls that pin out and continues to sew. Make sure that your pins are not that close to the folded edge so that you do not have them running into the presser foot of your sewing machine. We will repeat this process going all the way up the length of the shade, but we will not create a pocket at the last top segment. We're going to go ahead and skip ahead here to the last 11 and a half inch segment. All of the pockets are sewn here. Our shade has nine pockets, so we have effectively taken up nine inches of fabric in the length. Your shade may have a completely different number of pockets depending on its length. The last pin at the top at the 11 and a half inch segment, which is now 11 inches, is not folded upon. Next, we'll be concentrating on the ribs for the pockets. We've laid our outside fabric with the decorative pattern laying down against the tabletop, wrong side facing up, and then laid the lining on top of that with the rib pockets facing up. The plastic ribs that are included in the Roman Shade Roller Clutch Kit can be cut with wire cutters. We've marked the ribs to the correct size. Those ribs should be the length of the pocket minus a half inch. So at the ends of the pockets, there's approximately a quarter inch of fabric that does not contain a rib. Since the lining fabric contains a hem, the easiest way to insert the rib is to place a scrap rib in one of the ends and then the rib that you intend to insert in the sleeve in the other and push it through quickly. Typically, it will skip past the hem doing this rather quickly. You can see at the ends here, there's approximately a quarter inch of fabric that does not contain the rib. Since this fits perfectly, we're going to remove it from the pocket and use it as a standard to cut all of our ribs to size. Once the ribs are cut to size, we can insert them into each of the pockets. Remember, we're going to use another rib at the other end so that it can easily slip past the hem at the edge of the lining fabric. To keep the ribs from coming out of the pocket, you can do one of two things. You can sew them shut by hand, the ends of the pocket, or you can use the basting slash tacking gun. This gun has a very small needle and we are inserting a basting tacking fastener. This fastener is very similar to the tagging methods that are used for attaching price tags on clothing. But these basting tacking fasteners are much shorter. Inserting one at the end of each pocket will prevent the ribs from coming out of the pockets. We closed all nine of our pocket ends in less than two minutes. If you do that by hand with a hand needle and thread, it may take you an hour or more. It's now time to finish the top edge of our Roman shade. To do that, we need to start at the bottom edge. Now that all the ribs are inserted in the pockets of the lining fabric, let's concentrate a little bit on the decorative fabric at the bottom edge. At the bottom of the decorative fabric, this is the wrong side, of the decorative fabric, he will measure up one inch. He's using the clear acrylic ruler for that. And then places a pin at a few strategic locations along that one inch measurement. We'll be using this as a reference of where the bottom edge of the lining fabric should stop. The lining fabric was folded away from this bottom edge. Now he'll place it back over the bottom edge of the decorative fabric, being sure it's centered left and right, and it is also one inch above the decorative fabric's finished bottom edge. And now it is pinned in place along that edge about every three to four inches so that it will not move. 
with the bottom edge of the lining fabric pinned on the decorative fabric and it's also centered, he will push the shade off the table. The bottom edge is hanging off the table and he's working with the top edge here. By pushing it off the table and then pulling it back over top of the table, he's ensured that everything is laying nice and flat. And then he just double checks. With everything laying flat, he checks to make sure that the lining fabric is centered upon the decorative fabric. We do not want any of the edges to be visible when the shade is complete. Now he's pulled the bottom edge off the table again, just so he can gain access to the top edge of the shade. Our lining fabric is fairly soft, so he's ensuring that the lining fabric is laying flat, and then he will use a straight edge along the top edge of the material, and he will place the straight edge about an inch away from the decorative fabric on the underside. He will create a one inch single hem here on the lining fabric. Along the line that was just struck down, we will cut away the excess fabric. Then marks are placed right along the edge of the folded decorative fabric underneath. These marks will be used so we can strike a line along them and then we can fold upon that line. We'll be folding the edge of the lining fabric under so it's up against the decorative fabric. To make this job a little easier Zach's going to move the lining fabric back and then use a straight edge and strike a line between the marks he just made on the fabric. We'll be using basting tape after this and apply it to the underside of the lining fabric and then creating that one inch hem or folding directly on top of the line that we struck on the lining fabric. Notice that we're folding the fabric back so that the one inch hem will be facing the underside of the decorative fabric and we're folding right along that pencil line that we struck on the fabric. And next we'll apply basting tape on top of that one inch hem. If you don't want to use basting tape you can use pins in lieu of this. Now that edge is folded back over top of the decorative fabric and it is basted in place. We either want it directly on the edge of the decorative fabric or slightly under it, depending on how you created the hem. We do not want the lining fabric to be exposed over the top edge of the decorative fabric. A one inch hook and loop Velcro is included in each of the Roman Shade Roller Clutch Kits. We have measured its length here. We want it to be the exact length of the finished shade from decorative edge to decorative edge, and we've cut it to size. We apply basting tape to the underside, peel off the transfer paper revealing the glue, then we'll baste the looped section to the top edge of the shade. Be sure it does not extend past the top edge of the decorative fabric. We do not want it to be visible when it's sewn in place. It is easier to sew the looped portion rather than the hooked portion, so that's why the looped portion gets sewn to the shade. We will now sew the loop in place, but we're also not only sewing this strip, uh, one inch strip of loop in place, we're also sewing the decorative fabric to the lining fabric and also the loop strip to all of it. Now, there are ribs in the decorative fabric, so folding it up onto the table makes it a lot easier to keep your stitch nice and straight as you sew through this assembly. So we're sewing along the top edge of the one inch loop strip, and then we'll do some reversing at both ends to lock the stitch in place. Then we will sew the bottom edge of the one inch loop strip, doing reversing yet again to the beginning and end of our sewing. This secures the looped strip, the lining fabric, and the decorative fabric all to each other at the top edge of our shade. In the next chapter, we need to tack or attach the lining to the decorative fabric. The lining fabric with its pockets needs to be attached to the decorative fabric. We're going to use the basting tacking gun to do this as well. The fabric is attached at the bottom of each rib, as close to that rib as possible. This is along the bottom side of the rib, not the top. 
The basting tacking fasteners are a translucent color and are almost invisible, but it is wise to keep them aligned in a straight line going up the length of the shade because they may be slightly visible. This is a quick way to attach the lining fabric to the decorative fabric. However, you can use a needle and thread and hand sew them together at the same location if you choose. The camera's angle is changing here, but remember, we're attaching these at the bottom of each one of those rib pockets, not at the top. The fabric should be attached together at the location where a lift line will be installed. Our shade requires three lift lines. Yours may require a different amount. So here, Zach is attaching uh, the fabric together at the center location as well as the sides. So for our shade, at three locations along the bottom edge of each rib. The pins at the bottom can now be removed. In order for the shade to sit nicely, a weight rod is necessary at the bottom edge. That's next. A weight rod is included in the Roman Shade Roller Clutch Kits. It needs to be cut to size, slightly smaller than the lining fabric's width. It is a steel rod and slightly heavy, and it will require a hacksaw to be cut to size. In kits that accommodate wide shades, you may have more than one weight rod with a splicer, so they can be joined together. We typically like to insert the weight rod in the bottom sleeve of the lining fabric. We will use the basting tacking gun yet again to install some of the fasteners to keep the weight rod in place. We are not penetrating the decorative fabric, only the lining fabric. In lieu of using this tool, you can hand sew the weight rod inside that sleeve with needle and thread. Next, we'll show a quick way to install the rings, the ladder safety tape, and then the lines. The rings and the ladder safety tape are attached to each rib. To do this, we're going to refer back to the Sayerite fabric calculator and look at our calculations and the lining measurements. For our shade, it says secure lift lines 1.5 inches inside edges and 14.25 inch centers across each rib pocket. Roman shade roller clutch kits will include enough ladder tape, rings, clamps, and line to accommodate the size of shade that you picked. Place a ring onto the clamp. We'll start at the lower pocket. This is the one at the bottom of the shade. Then insert one of the legs of the clamp through the ladder safety tape. We're going to use hog ring pliers, which in my opinion are worth purchasing if you plan to do these types of Roman shades. We'll position the ladder tape, the clamp, and the ring about one and a half inches from the edge of the shade and then clamp it in place with the hog ring pliers. Once it's clamped in place, position the ring through the ladder safety tape opening, as seen here. Draw the ladder safety tape up fairly snug and determine where the next clamp with ring should be installed. The ladder safety tape will encase the lifting cord that will be installed a little bit later on. It helps to eliminate dangerous cord loops on the back of the shade that could pose a strangulation hazard for small children. As the shade is laying flat on the table, the ladder safety tape should be run along the length of the shade so that it is flat as possible and does not have any major gaps. If an opening does not rest directly on top of the shade, always allow the ladder safety tape to be slack rather than too tight. If it were too tight, it would interfere with the shade when the shade is extended all the way to the lowest position in the window. The Sayrite Fabric Calculator designs this shade with spacing of ribs to be no more than about 8 inches. The spacing of the ribs and the use of the ladder safety tape should make these shades fairly safe for small children. However, you should always take all precautions possible to protect children from using or gaining access to a shade with lift lines. A notice that Zach is showing a different way to install the clamps and rings onto the ribs. He takes a clamp, places a ring on its leg, places one of the legs through the ladder tape, positions it over the rib and around the rib, then he uses the hog ring pliers and crimps it in place over that rib. Oftentimes with Roman shades with rings, 
The rings are attached via thread and needle by hand sewing them in place. As you can see here, using these clamps makes it very quick. At the last rib at the top of the shade, the ladder safety tape can be cut. We want to cut it so that it leaves one section of horizontal pieces that join the left and the right side together, so approximately one inch above the ring. The width of our shade requires three lift lines, so we're positioning this lift line directly in the middle of the shade. We can see the decorative fabric underneath so we can determine where the center is. Depending on the width of your shade, you may have more or less lift lines. The lift lines at the sides are typically spaced about one and a half inches from the sides. The Serite Fabric Calculator does tell you exactly where to position the center or intermediate uh, rings and clamps, but they are typically spaced around 14 to 17 inches apart. Zach is almost done installing the ladder safety tape and the rings. When he's done, he needs to insert the line that's included with the Roman Shade Roller Clutch Kits through the rings and the ladder safety tape. He's starting here at the top, and he feeds it through about every third ladder. He ensures that he goes through the ring that's attached to each one of the ribs and the ladder portion at that ring. See here, he went through the ladder safety tape as well. This will ensure that the lift cord does not easily separate from the ladder safety tape, and thus it makes it more child resistant. When we reach the bottom of the shade, we will attach onto that line that we just fed through a cord adjuster orb. These orbs are also included in the kit. Feed it about four inches or so onto the end of the line. Then go to the top of the shade and pull on that line past the top of the shade by approximately 10 inches. We will cut the cord there. If you use scissors, use a lighter or something to burn the end of the cord to keep it from unraveling. Here we're using the Serite Edge Hot Knife. Repeat that process for all of the lift lines. Using some wood, we'll make a headrail. The brackets that are included in the kit measure about two inches in length, so we need to install them in a board that is approximately two inches wide by no less than three quarter inches thick. The board should be cut to equal the exact width of the shade when finished. Our board is a little bit skinny of two inches and it'd be better if it were one inch thick, but it will work. We need to attach the hook and loop. We're going to attach the hook side of it onto the edge of the board. We're using a pneumatic staple gun available from Serite, but you can also use a hand staple gun that you may already have in your toolbox. To cut the aluminum shade roller to its appropriate length, we lay it up to the edge of the shade and mark its width. And then we need to subtract one and a quarter inches from the overall width of the shade. This one and a quarter inches cut away from the overall width of the finished shade will accommodate for the hardware. This roller is easy to cut with a hacksaw. We will now lay the newly cut roller at the top edge of the shade, centering it between the left and right side. Then we will take our lift lines and pull them up and over the top of the aluminum roller. Now we know where they will rest on the roller and we will mark it with a sharpie marker or something similar on the aluminum roller itself where those lines would rest. Then from those marked positions measure over three inches and place a new mark. Do that for each one of the locations where a lift line will, will be wrapped around the tubing. At the opposite end, we need to measure the opposite direction. That's not a big deal at all. So three inches from that mark. The roller clutch unit has two internal grooves on the roller portion. Those line up with the two prongs on the inside of the aluminum tubing, and it is pushed onto the end. The opposite end is pushed in in the same manner. We inserted the two ends of the roller clutch unit onto the tubing prematurely. We'll do that later on, so ignore that step. Kits also include the soft shade roller clips. 
We've inserted the line through one of the small holes and then tie a double knot on the end of the line to keep it from coming through one of those holes. The line was inserted through the underside of the clip, as shown here. We will now feed the line to the opposite end of the clip, as shown here, and then snap the clip onto the one and a half inch aluminum tubing. We want to snap the clip on at that three inch mark that we uh, marked on the aluminum tubing. And here we're doing it at the center position, three inches from the mark that indicates where the line will come up over the top of the tubing. We also want them to be lined up with each other, so our shade has three of these clips. Yours may have more. Notice that for this last clip, the line is going towards Zach underneath the clip, because that's the initial mark which indicated where the line rested on top of the tubing on that end. The brackets should be screwed to the end of the board. Here Zach is marking the position to pre-drill a hole and then insert a screw. We like to pre-drill the hole to keep the boards from possibly splitting when the screws are inserted. This board is a little bit smaller than our recommended specs of 1 inch by 2 inch, the actual size that we'd like to use, but it will still work. Remember earlier we said not to install the roller clutch unit. Here's why. We need to remove it to install the bead chain. You can roll this clutch assembly by grasping the outer portion and rolling the inner portion. You'll notice there are cogs. Two of them are different than all the others. Feed the chain up and under the bar and into those two cogs. Then you can either roll the inner portion of the clutch or the outer housing around it, thus feeding the chain into all of the cogs. Now the chain comes out the opposite side. Be sure to pull it under the bar, as seen here. When it comes time to install the shade, we'll be installing it with the shade fully extended, so we will find the center position of the chain, so the two halves are equal on the left and the right side of this unit. Determine which side you want the chain installed on your shade, whether it be a left position clutch or a right position clutch. Looking ahead at this finished shade, you can see that the ball chain is to the right on our shade. It's your choice. Here's a look ahead at the back of the shade as if we were looking through the window. This is how the shade will operate. Our Roman shade is now ready to be installed. That's next. Our Roman shade will be an inside mount. But if your desire was to make it an outside mount, as shown here, you would still need the head rail. In other words, the board. You may be asking, why not just mount the brackets to the window casing itself rather than the board? Well, we can't because we need the hook and loop surface to be even with the front side of the bracket, so the Roman shade can be mounted right in front of the roller system. To hide the roller in the hardware, you can fashion a piece of fabric like this and attach it to the side of your head rail. You can use the basting tacking gun to keep the fabric together at the corner. Ours is an inside mount. Once we have the head rail centered in the opening of the window, we will screw it in position. Since ours is an inside mount, all we need to do is screw directly into the window casing. If yours is an outside mount, you will need to purchase L brackets from a hardware store. Now we're ready to install the shade. On one end, there is a spring-loaded end pin. Push it into the roller bracket first. The pin will give so you can slide the clutch into place into its bracket. The shade has the weight rod at the bottom, so we'll place it on the sill, and then just simply pull it up to the hook and loop and attach it there. Be sure that it's centered and even across the top. The nice thing about the hook and loop is that if it isn't, you can readjust it. Now we can concentrate on the bottom edge to make sure that it's level as the shade is being raised. To do this, Zach pulls on the bead chain to raise the shade slightly. Now we can determine if the bottom edge is level. Any adjustments that need to be made to its height can be done at each lift line via the orbs. All of the orbs should be adjusted so that the shade raises evenly across its width. Not just the two outer orbs, but any inner orbs need to be adjusted that way as well. 
Do not expect your shade to fold up beautifully right away. It will need to be trained, and we'll show you how to do that a little bit later on, so don't let that alarm you. We've already trained ours slightly here. Zach continues to make adjustments to the orbs until he's happy with the way the shade is raising and lowering. This looks pretty good. Nice and level across the bottom, and it raises up evenly across the width. You can do one of two things to adjust the leftover line at the bottom of the shade. Either roll some of the extra line onto the roller at the top and reset the orb positions at the bottom edge, or cut the excess line off at the bottom edge. We're using a hot knife, so we can cut the line and it'll also seal the ends of the line at the same time. If you decide to just simply cut the end of the line, don't cut it too close to the orb. Leave a little bit of extra for adjustments. Now raise the shade to the highest position. This is the position that you want the shade to stop at. Now, on the bead chain that's to the rear of the window, mark the bead at the highest point. In other words, right at the entry point of the clutch hardware. Then lower the bead, finding that bead that you marked, and place a stop on it. The only issue with marking the bead with a permanent marker is you can see it through the invisible stop. Now lower the shade all the way to the sill. Once it's there, then we'll mark the bead at the front portion of the clutch system. Or you can take note of which bead it is. And now pull the chain so you can gain access to it and install yet another stop there. These stops are included in the kit. With those stops in place, your shade will stop at the appropriate spot that you desire in the up position and also in the down position. Determine how far down you want the ball chain to come alongside the window and then cut off the excess. We want to make this a continuous loop, so we're going to use the ball chain connector here to join these two ends together. One end fits on one side and the other end on the opposite. Then the cover just simply snaps over the top, locking the chain and connecting the two ends. Utilizing the hold down clamp that's included, our bead chain will be a little bit safer for small children. Position the clip on your wall or window well so that the cord can move freely without being too slack. Screw the clip into place using two screws that are provided. If you're screwing into drywall or another substrate rather than wood, be sure to use the appropriate anchors for your application. How to train your Roman shade is next. It is highly likely that since this shade is new, it will not fold up neatly as it is pulled up. That's because the material needs to be trained to do so. So we're gonna pull the shade up to its highest position and work out any wrinkles, being sure that the folds are done consistently and neatly. Then we'll use spring clamps or large office clamps and clamp each one of the folds in place. This will help the fabric to take on a memory. Then once the shade is pulled up, it will fold in those spots. Leave those on for a day or two and check again and make modifications if required. Then your shade will be trained. Coming up is the full materials list and all of the tools that we used to build this Roman shade with Roar Clutch System. Here is the list of materials and tools that we use to make this Roman shade with roller clutch system. Items marked with a yellow star are required. Items marked with a yellow plus are highly recommended. The Roman shade roller clutch kits from Sayerite come with almost all the required items needed to build the shade, except for the decorative and lining fabric. Other required items such as thread, pins, and the wood board you may already have on hand or you could purchase separately. You can select your Roman Shade Roller Clutch Kit by entering your measurements at the Sayrite Fabric Calculator and then clicking on Hardware Kit. It will pull the correct Roman Shade Roller Clutch Kit for your particular shade size. If you have questions about the Roman Shade Roller Clutch Kits or the fabric that's required, give us a call or email us. We're glad to help. 
For more free video tutorials like this, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel or visit Sayerite's website. Here are some related videos to the Roman shade that we just accomplished. Click one of the links here if you'd like to see one of those videos. I'm Eric Grant, and from all of us here at Sayerite, thanks for watching.